Hello? Normally this week we'd be having an episode of the Nintendo Power Retrospectives, but this week I'm deciding to change things up a bit. Because I have a question to ask. Where's the fair use? A while back I had done an episode of Breaking It All Down, where I reviewed a professional wrestling event, Wrestle Kingdom 1. This was kind of an attempt to test the waters a little bit, to see if there would be interest among viewers, such as you out there, about whether you'd want to see me review wrestling events. I'd seen Spoonie's reviews of wrestling events, I'd seen some other similar things for WWE stuff, I thought, hey, Japanese pro wrestling is something that's not covered as much in video reviews, so let's give it a shot. This was back when Blip was a thing that exists, and the version that I uploaded on YouTube was the same version I uploaded to Blip, and because I was new to this whole thing, I was using copyrighted music for my opening credits, specifically the version of Masters of the Universe by Hawkwind from their album Live Chronicles. And I got a copyright notice on that, taking my ad revenue on YouTube. For, and this was from the people who did, the people who own the rights to Hawkwind's music, their, their label. And I didn't challenge that because, well, it was a reasonable thing for it to happen. Like, yeah, I'm in retrospect, I'm kind of wrong there. This is the reason why I use Creative Commons licensed music now. There's some more things. Most of my old blip stuff that had the Hawkwind music has been copyright flagged for using that music, and I'm kind of okay with that. But then I decided to do my Let's Play of Halo 4. And in my Let's Play, the record label for the Muse soundtrack to the game took the ad revenue for every episode of my Let's Play. And this seemed unreasonable to me. And this is part of a similar situation where other, well, video game Let's Players and reviewers were having the video, their videos, their Let's Plays reviews flagged because they were using music from the games in question. And it's flagged over by the people who did the soundtracks for those games. And I appealed these claims. And as I was going through the appeals process, I received a message from the record label. And I would describe the message as extortive. The gist of the message was that if I, that while, whether or not my, my use of the footage was under the category of fair use, because it was using the the music in the con larger context of the game itself while discussing the game that if I continue to use the music if I did not release these release my counterclaims, my appeals they could and would take the videos down and if they took more than three set more than three takedown notices my channel would go down and this put me in a bit of a pickle because it's one thing when you're an established creator. You're someone like Doug Walker or Brad Jones or even a, a somewhat lower level creator like Mars Girl or Angry Joe. I don't know whether Jim Sterling's at the uh, Doug Walker level or if he's more at the Mars Girl level or somewhere in between. Probably him at Angry Joe are in the middle. It, they have a significant audience. They make enough money via... Like, Sterling makes enough money via Patreon that he is able to do video production as his full-time job. Um, so, if they do a Let's Play or a Let's, something like a Let's Play, or if they use footage with the music intact for a video... Um, in their videos, and they get enough strikes on them for a takedown, because they're because they have chosen to appeal the take the ad revenue claims. They can raise a fuss 
and people will listen. It'll get picked up by other outlets. I mean, if Jim Sterling's channel goes down because he's using music from Konami games while talking about Konami games and showing footage of Konami games all in, all in the context of that game, say Silent Hill, Resident Evil, Castlevania, for example, and Konami says, nope, we're sending, um, we're sending, uh, we're taking your ad revenue, assuming he had ad, re ad revenue, he doesn't monetize his videos because he's got the Patreon, but bear with me. This could work for Angry Joe as well. And there's an appeal by, again, let's stick with Jim Sterling. Jim Sterling appeals, and then Konami comes in and, ha and takes down the videos and causes his channel to go down entirely. If Jim Sterling, or Angry Joe, or who, or a person of a similar level, Hell, even if Total Biscuit had the, their channel pulled down under similar situations, they made a they made a claim. They, they, they posted about this on Twitter, on Facebook. Maybe not Total Biscuit because he retired from social media. I'm, I'm digressing. But if Sterling or Angry Joe posted about this on Twitter and Facebook, this would get picked up by GameSpot. This would get picked up by by. Giant Bomb, by Kotaku, by other games media outlets who would call attention to this, and there would be a, a massive magnifying outcry over this action, and either YouTube would do something, or Konami would do something. Probably not Konami, just because of the current situation with Konami, but the game publisher would do something, or YouTube would do something, because the outcry was enough where they were forced to do something. It'd be the same thing with PewDiePie. If this happened to PewDiePie's videos, perhaps even more so PewDiePie's videos, since PewDiePie himself has become part of the one of the flagship programs of the YouTube Red brand. Uh, brand. If with me, if the record label who put out the Halo soundtrack caused my videos to go down because I used footage from the Halo games. If I mention this on on Facebook or Twitter or Tumblr or wherever, it might get some magnification. It might be some people saying, hey, that sucks. But those people saying that would be either my Patreon backers, both of them, or my friends. It wouldn't go the same viral outbreak. So under the circumstances, my response was to let them keep the, my ad revenue in the videos until such a time that YouTube rolled out their, at least to me, their scrub the music out of the audio track thing. In which case that worked and I was safe, basically. This happened again with Nintendo Power Retrospectives. With, with the Let's Play, Let's Plays, most of my money doesn't come from Let's Plays. So, it wasn't as big a deal, but people backed me on Patreon for Nintendo Power Retrospectives. People want to see my Nintendo Power Retrospectives on Retroware, that that's one of the things that actually gets the series views. It's kind of, it, I describe it as my bread and butter if I made enough to buy bread and butter with it. Sort of I make enough to buy bread and butter with it, but, any, from it. but anyway. And I was covering, for one of the episodes, Mega Man 3. And Mega Man 3 was my pick of the week, and at that time, my picks for each episode would get featured in the closing credits, either some gameplayable level or a boss fight. I tried to go with boss fights because boss fights have distinct music. And I got a copyright strike, not strike, but a flag, and with my ad revenue taken from that video by Capcom. I appealed it. Because uh, the context was I'm using the gameplay footage of a boss fight, which I talked from a game, which I talked about over the course of the episode. And I won that copyright appeal, but never the thought came into my mind after that, this could happen to me again. And since then, I've had to, on my videos, well, I haven't had to, but on my videos, I've been using music from OC Remix, because they let you use their music. And you can see where this is going, where I'm forced to take sort of very distinct compromises in how I present my video. To appeal cop to be able to basically a very arbitrary, not clearly set in any sort of 
under any sort of criteria rule system. And now with my video reviews of films and such, the general rule of thumb for fair use in journalism for using footage is no more than 30 seconds at a time. If you want to avoid the, the content ID bots, it's generally easier to use 30 seconds at a time, or safer, not 30 seconds, but safer to use less than 30 seconds, use close to 15 seconds. And so, with my video reviews now of movies and such, I have started using 15 second clips. This causes problems if you're wanting to present a work and highlight particular points of a film or how work is done, like a long shot or a, or a big one, one and done shot, long takes. It's even bigger deal if you do something like a long take in animation, particularly with something like, for example, in, in um, Memories, the Castle Hero Otomo anthology film, or Amura Oshii's Angel's Egg, which is a review you'll be seeing later this month. There comes to be a situation where when editing is an important part of a film and how a film is put together, you're ch ending up being forced to chop a film to pieces in order to present this stuff. Similarly, with, well, I haven't gotten on my video game footage in terms of copyright flags on that at present. I've had problems in the past where, for example, I did my best of the rests and um, best and worst of E3 videos, where when I used footage from a trailer that was put forward at E3 in my video, and the person whose video I'm talking about, or game I'm talking about, would put a copyright flag in my video. This happened with, I think like 2014 or 2013, is the year that, Sleeping, that the Sleeping Dogs trailer came out. And at the time, Sleeping Dogs was one of my best, of the best games of E3, along with, I want to say, Persona um, for the Arena and Rock Band Blitz. And for those, I got three flags on the video. One from Ubisoft, one from Atlas, and one from a third-party broadcaster in South America over the Rockman Blitz trailer. These are all Content ID bot stuff. I appealed all three. This is all ad, taking your ad revenue stuff. No takedown notices here. The only one I've gotten is for the for the Wrestle Kingdom video. And of those, third party did not appeal, um, did not contest my appeal on the Rock Man Blood stuff. I think it was a pretty clear cut case of they didn't actually own the footage that they were taking me from, taking my ad revenue over or cut my ad revenue over, so off they went. For the Rock Band, yeah, for the Rock Man Blitz. For Persona, I, I, they wanted to get the word out there. I just wanted to get the word out there for Persona the Arena, and the fact that this was on my best of E3 video probably didn't hurt. No love from Ubisoft, though. And despite the fact that I, at the time, was all into what they were presenting with Watch Dogs, and the way their world was set up, and the implications of technology and the narrative, and that sort of thing, they said, no, we're still going to keep your ad revenue, and I still haven't seen a dime from that video. And then there's the Wrestle Kingdom video, and the issue with that where it got particularly bad. And I chose not to appeal the takedown for a couple of reasons. First is there was already ad revenue on the, taken from, from the video from the record label, and so I'm not sure how well I could defend the video in that light. I feel it's kind of out of luck there. Secondly, Japanese companies are notorious for, well, 
not getting the internet, not understanding it. I did do a first appeal, basically saying, hey, this is a video which is very transformative. I'm not giving away the full matches. I'm not giving, showing the matches in their entirety. I'm showing relevant portions of the match. And I'm even using the industry standard star rating system as far as industry criticism star rating system, five stars, for discussing the matches and what I thought of them and that sort of thing. And the response, and that appeal was turned down by New Japan Pro Wrestling. And now my options were if I, if I appealed again, I'd have to go to court. And there'd be the double issue of where am I going to court at? And how do I feel to go to court? How do I afford to go to court? Because it's one thing if you're hiring, if you're contacting the EFF for legal assistance to get help dealing with a court case in the United States. But if we go to court, is New Japan taking me to court in the U.S.? Or is New Japan taking me to court in Japan? They didn't just block my video in Japan. They dropped, they took down my video all, all over the world, but technically it's a Japanese company, so how do I deal with this? So, the other por difficulty with this is I had lost the footage of the video, my, my original video, in a, co in a hard drive crash prior to this. So, if it was to go to an attorney to actually take them to court, or rather, to be taken to court. I would need to have a copy of the video. I would need to be able to go to an attorney at the EFF, or an attorney recommended by the EFF, when I'm facing the potential risk of being sued over my review. The first thing they'll ask. Certainly. When you go to them, is going to be, Show me the video. Show me the video, and we'll see if you have a case. If you don't have a case, we're not going to represent you. Not unless you have a lot of money to throw at us, in the to pay us, in the hopes of us outlasting this other company, and we're not going to outlast this other company. So, there's that. And even I went to my my network, because I'm technically part of Maker, since when Blip shut down, or the Maker slash Disney shut down Blip, everyone who was on Blip got offered a spot on Maker. I went to Maker, they say, show me the video. And I can't show them the video, because I don't have access to it. My old copy was lost at the crash, and the version that's on YouTube, I can't see either. So, this has led to me th thinking about all this, is, all that has come up under what's the, where's the fair use and the, the hashtag W2FU. Doug Walker, Zenith Will Review, Mars Girl, Suede, all of them have brought up excellent points, oh, especially Jim Sterling on this hashtag. Or for that matter, Pat the NES Punk on his completely unnecessary podcast. All these other people have put together excellent work talking about this, and many more whose YouTube channels I don't subscribe to. And so they brought up the, their issues they've run into. And I'll say the one thing that doesn't come up much is okay, what are solutions? Aside from YouTube needs to talk to us more. This is brought up somewhat on Pat's video. And Zenith Review on his kind of gets into, hey, if now, if the content creators aren't going to respect copyright law, why should, me? And why should we? And that is, to a certain degree, a valid complaint. But if we're actually going to win this, if we're going to sway YouTube to our side and sway lawmakers and the courts to our side, we do have to at least pretend like we are the ones on the side of the angels. Because certainly... The copyright holders, the studios, the MPAA, the RIAA, and the net, and the people who they hire to represent them when it comes to going onto YouTube and taking down videos and taking ad revenue from videos, 
those people are also going to be trying to make themselves like, look like they are on the side of the angels when it when when it comes to copyright, when it comes to the development of the internet as a medium. They are definitely on the side of the devils. Oh, before I get too far into this, I also definitely want to laud as if debris video on this topic as well. I'm going to try and get all these together and put links to all of them in the show notes or on the, the sidebar thing since by the time the video comes out, I will now be able to do annotations again. I'll now be able to do a little sidebar thing majing up over here again. You should watch all those. So, with that aside, the next step, aside from just continuing this conversation and asking the question over and over, where's the fair use, is to have things which we can put forward to say, here's what you can do, Google, to make things better. And there are several fronts which YouTube can improve. The first and simplest is Make it so that you cannot, that uh, copyright claims, whether taking your ad revenue or taking on a video, must be filed by a person. You, if they don't have CAPTCHAs and other stuff like that in their takedown process already, they need to have them. As it is the bot, I mean, it's clear that they don't because there's the whole issue with bots. If, if bots worked, if bots were not a problem, then human beings would be watching everything, and there'd presumably be someone on the other side of the keyboard before they click the button who can think of the que think about and answer the question: Is this fair use? A question which the Supreme Court says said you have to answer. So that's the first part of this. Second, there are two concepts from the legal side of things, which YouTube can introduce to the copyright and management process, which they would improve things. These concepts are the vexious litigant and because of the vex and strategic lawsuit against public participation or slap, or a copyright equivalent thereof. Let's start with slap. Slap's the simpler one. Strategic lawsuit against public participation is basically a way where someone is being critical of you in public, your political views or political perspectives you're putting forward or the policies you are attempting to institute to sue you to make you go away. To, to say, oh, this law, to say, Yo, you're defaming me by saying that this law I'm trying to institute is racist. So this is defamation, this is slander or libel, I'm going to sue you for that. Or other things to find ways to bog down your political opponents in court, particularly if they're smaller people, politically, or lower income level people, because you can then sue them, and basically financially wipe them out so they can no longer continue their efforts. The more that their time and energy, both mental and physical energy, is focused on this lawsuit as opposed to stopping what you're trying to do or, for, or pushing forward their own political goals. Now, in a lot of jurisdictions, slap lawsuits are illegal. One of these jurisdictions is, or is in Oregon. Now... I guess what the YouTube equivalent would be, there's no catchy acronym for it, like SLAP, but like Strategic Claim Against Public Criticism, or something like that. And what this would basically be, as far as for YouTube banning these, is if you are a content creator, there are harsher criteria that you have to prove when putting any sort of copyright claim on someone who's critical of your work. So, for example, the various Russian game developers who did the who have done um, Unity asset flips in the form of games that Jim Sterling has called attention to, or film critic or, or filmmakers like 
the guy who made the movie who um, I hate everything criticized and he had it taken down. I forget the guy's name. Probably for the best that we just forget who we forget he exists and let him fade. Um, or for that matter, a ways back when the room hadn't quite caught its full cult following yet as a as a great bad movie. Tommy Wiseau sent takedown notices against Nostalgia Critic for his review of The Room. Now I don't think he really cares. He gets money from it. He gets money from The Room. From people seeing the, what The Room is and thinking, oh my god, this movie's so terrible, I have to own a copy. I have to show it to my friends. That sort of thing. I don't think he minds so much about that anymore, but the same general principle applies. If you're reviewing a work, if I'm reviewing a work, if any of you in the audience, what have you, if you do a review, and you use content from that work in a review, the burden of proof from the filmmaker, the musician, the writer, the artist, the whatever, it comes to saying, oh, you can't use content from my work when reviewing my work, that burden becomes higher. This should theoretically, if, if, if this were instituted properly, admittedly, YouTube's track record and this is like instituting a concept and following up on it is not great. For example, there's there, as Jim Serling mentioned in, mentioned in his video, there is you, there was the policy that YouTube announced of they would provide a certain amount of money for legal defense for people who have copyright claims against them, and which Jim Sterling has not received much support from, aside from dealing with the Russian asset flippers. But this is a concept that would certainly help protect critics. Particularly independent critics who don't have a organization backing them. If Siskel and Ebert were to do their show now on YouTube, for as if they were alive and they did at the movies as a YouTube show, un done independently, without the affiliation of PBS or another organization, they would be at very distinct risk of getting takedown notices with their videos taken down because they gave review videos and films a negative review. This is not to say that the, that the amount of footage they used in their show was not fair use. It was absolutely fair use. They fit all the criteria of what makes fair use. But this wouldn't stop people from sending takedown claims, whether a human being or an automated robot ever their takedowns or taking ad revenue. Having a copyright claim equivalent of slap would help mitigate that. The second part would be the vexious claimant, for lack of a better term, and instituting that concept. And what this basically does would help mitigate some of the issues with organizations like record labels or studios hiring third parties to do claims on their behalf and these groups don't necessarily care about actually instituting these claims properly and don't care about making sure that when they file a copyright claim whether or not it's actually fair use. Particularly these groups are groups which get a cut of the ad revenue from whatever they put a claim on. I don't know how these groups get paid. And the idea behind this would be is that basically if you're doing copyright claims you have to have an equivalent of a kill-death ratio, basically, a, a, a positive kill-death ratio. A, a, the idea being is, if your copyright claim level, if you're, if you're shooting out 100,000 copyright claims a, mo a month, for example, on YouTube, this may be actually a very low ball figure, but it's a nice round number and easy to figure. If, say, only 1% of those, if, of those claims, all of them get appealed and on review only 2% or 5% get upheld, you don't get to file claims anymore unless you are directly the rights holder. And you can prove you're the rights holder because you're the person who submitted the work, you have submitted documentation to YouTube to show that you are the person who created the work, you own and hold the copyright, and you will, you thus are in a position to defend it. If it's, 
if you're a third party who is contracted with a copyright holder, you your permission your privileges are denied. The rights holder can do copyright claims on their own, but they have to do it themselves. Neither of these on their own are perfect. Certainly. But it shifts the, the structure of how things are done and how copyright claims are handled to hopefully create a situation where things, while they aren't even between the internet content creators, the critics, the people who do parody and satire of creative work, of films on the internet, things may not be even. The scales are balanced a little bit more on our side. Or at least, we have a bit more weight on our side. Because we can't, because, as things can't stand to now, unless there's a sudden change in what the legislative makeup of the U.S. government is, we're not going to get, be able to totally overwhelm Hollywood, or the record labels, or what have you. But as things stand now, when it comes to YouTube, who has a de facto monopoly on, U on internet video production and monetization, because, well, yeah, there's daily motion, and yes, they let you monetize, but YouTube, when it comes to their, at, to their search results, particularly the search results for video, weights, uh, Google weights YouTube higher than Dailymotion or Vimeo or other services. Bing treats Dailymotion a little better, but not a lot of people use Bing for very good reasons. It's not a great, not necessarily a great search engine. So, how do we mitigate these issues? Well, how do, do these two points that we to mitigate these issues? Well, particularly three ideas. We eliminate the bots. We require, we've required that if somebody's filing a copyright claim in any form, they have to have watched the video. And they have to do not just mark out a chunk of the video which has the offending footage, they have to explain why the content of the video is not fair use. Secondly, when it comes to the content of the video being what if it's a review, we put increased weight on the rights holders to demonstrate that whether or not something is or is not a review, and rather putting rather than putting the burden of proof on the critics to say, hey, I'm a critic, this is a review, I am discussing the artistic merit of a work, or performing literary criticism of a work for purposes of education, or just general criticism and discourse of an artistic me for discourse that furthers an artistic medium. That have is that going to prove that we're trying to do that? Then the proof is how are you not? It's it sounds like this is, it sounds sort of difficult, and still not still isn't perfect and not so helpful, but. The big burden of proof, but it, it it makes all the difference. It changes things from a point where we, the content creators, are guilty until proven innocent, which is how the DMCA works, how YouTube's copyright claim works, and change it to we are innocent until proven guilty, and and content creators must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that we are not doing a review, that we are not critics, and we are not engaging in criticism. And what that means from our standpoint is that basically we just have to do our job. We just have to write reviews. We have to perhaps do something slightly more than show footage, make a witty crip, and then walk away. We have to express an opinion. We do that, we're fine. Now, some things like Botchamania would still kind of fall into problems through this. But nostalgia Critic? Fine. Cinema Snob? Fine, Mars Girl, or Jim Sterling, or SF Debris, or hell, most Let's Players are probably fine. So, 
that. So having these, fl- eliminating, uh, having a way to stop strategic claims against public criticism, or internet criticism, again, I'm going to pit the acronym for this, that changes things a lot on our half. And finally, having repercussions for false claims. And this isn't just a situation for, well, pushing back against content creators. This also stops YouTube harassment. Think of all the times we've heard about people who, because they stated the opinion that someone didn't like on the internet, had people take down, send takedown notices against their video or false copyright strikes against their video. This has happened to everyone from Joe J. Random Vlogger to Anita Sarkeesian. Big people and little people are subjected to this with false copyright claims from just random people as a form of harassment. Not to mention, again, corporations outsourcing their copyright claim process and hunting down alleged infringing videos on YouTube to third-party companies. By having a way to say, no, you don't get the right to do claims anymore, you are a vexious claimant, that reduces the amount of possibility for harassment. Probably as other side you could do the vexed claimant thing in addition to if you if if you are in clearly engaging in a pattern in a of in a pattern of harassment, changing it so also if a person if of the copyright claims against a video are say if somebody gets a hundred thousand claims a month and only one percent of them are valid or even zero percent or none of them are valid that the amount of, that the steps people have to do when in doing claims against that person increases and becomes more higher and they have to jump through more hoops to do it as, a, as an additional side of things if we get those stuff like that involved where we penalize people for false claims we make it harder for critics to be penalized for being critics and we use these tools to additionally mitigate the potential for harassment whether by content creators or by just j random person who doesn't like what a youtube video creator is making or saying youtube will be a better place the internet will be a better place One last point before I wrap this up. I mentioned before that, there's, that we are limited in what we can do because we have to work not just with the YouTube structure, but within the structure of the law, of the law as it stands now. That, well, we have to work with the Digital Millennium Copyright Act and what limitations it puts on content creators and the fact that with the Digital Millennium Copyright Act YouTube producers people who make videos on the internet or podcasts or art are to a certain degree guilty until proven innocent transformative works fan works criticism exists by the grace of the people making the making the source material, the work that the fan work is based on, the piece of music that's used in the AMV, the work being reviewed. You want to change that. If you want to make fair use from a defense, from something you say in court to get your work protected, to get a claim overturned, to a shield, a burden of proof that must be overcome by a plaintiff, by someone filing a lawsuit, by someone filing a DMCA claim. If you want to change what fair use is to a clear-cut, inalienable right, you need to vote. This is an election year. And honestly, even if it wasn't an election year, as far as for presidential elections, there are the midterm elections for your local Senate, for Senates, or the U.S. Senate, for the House, 
there are state level legislative elections and there's ballot measures depending on your state if you, if you do the ballot measure thing if you register to vote if you go and you write your legislator saying hey these are the issues that's important to me the right of fair of free expression on the internet the rights of fair use are important to me and need to be defended that can change things and if you say and if you put on the code as the quote on this I am a voter I vote this is something I care about I will be caring about in the upcoming election and I and not only will I be caring about what you say you'll do but what you do and how you stand on things like the Trans-Pacific Partnership and what where you vote in the Trans-Pacific Partnership and what information is publicly available about the Trans-Pacific Partnership or whatever form SOPA or PIPA take again when they come back down the pipe if they do if you vote if you register to vote and you follow up on it that can change things just as much in fact significantly more than asking the question publicly on Twitter on Facebook in your newspaper at town hall meetings at whatever asking the question where's the fair use thank you very much for watching next week we will return to our regular schedule regularly scheduled reviewing thank you <laughs>again thank you very much for watching if you enjoyed the show please like and subscribe to this channel subscribe and get you notified when future episodes come out and liking lets me know that you enjoyed the episode the video on the right will be of the previous episode of nintendo power retrospectives if you want to go see it or you previously that on that show and the video on the left will take you to the previous episode of breaking it all down while you'll get to see what i covered there and below that will be a link to my Patreon page if you wish to back the show. Backing the show can get you a mention of the credits, and also, depending on your level of support, you can determine what I do future Let's Plays of on Breaking It All Down and what else I review on that show as well. So go ahead and click on that and back the show. Also, backing the show helps me get the show out more often and improve the production quality of the show, which is good for everybody. Once again, thank you very much for watching, and see you next time.